Well, it's good to be back, like I mentioned in the first service, and uh, it's good to see all of you here, and uh, I guess we didn't have the batteries charged, I don't know, I thought they were, maybe sometimes they're not, it's not in the thing all the way, but you know, we haven't done this in eight weeks, so I got on YouTube last night and watched some videos about how to preach, and some instructional videos about what to do, and I uh, see we have uh, Larry and the Geigers back here behind us. Great. I was wondering if the Geigers stay that far apart at home during the pandemic. I didn't know if that's what they do or not. Uh, but anyhow, so we're uh, good to be here as we continue going through 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, starting in verse 12. And I want to ask you the question today, where uh, do you find your joy? Where do do you find your joy? You don't find it in the news, amen? amen? You don't find it checking the coronavirus uh, stats every morning like I do, mainly to see how we're doing, mainly also to see when we can come back to, to worship. Uh, you don't find your joy there. You don't find it in the stock market because it's up and down every day. Thankfully, it's been up more than so lately. Can't find it in systems of thought. Can't find it in atheism. Voltaire, the famous atheist, wrote, he said, I wish I had never been born. Can't be found in pleasure. Lord Byron lived a life of pleasure, and he wrote, The worm, the canker, and grief are mine alone. Joy cannot be found in money. Jay Gold, an American millionaire, had plenty of wealth, and when he was dying, he said, I suppose I am the most miserable man on earth. Joy can't be found in position or fame. Lord Baconsfield enjoyed more than his share, and he wrote that youth is a mistake, manhood a struggle, old age a regret. And joy cannot be found in military glory. Alexander the Great conquered the known world in his day, and after he had done so, he wept in his tent, and someone asked him, why are you crying? And he said, there are no more worlds to conquer. Where then is real joy found? I think we know that the answer is in Christ alone. As we continue going through the book of 2 Corinthians, we need to remember that the theme of the book is to love God with our whole heart. And when we focus on loving him with all that we have, we find true joy. Today we're looking at a, a passage of scripture where the Apostle Paul, at a point of his life, he was anxious, he was afraid, and he was disheartened with his ministry at the church in Corinth. Yet he found his joy in Christ, and he continued to serve the people of Corinth. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 12. Paul says... When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was opened for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia. But thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not, like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us back today. I look out across this congregation and I see these faces I haven't seen in two months, some of them, many of them. You may see them online, may have talked to them on the phone, may have driven by their house and spoken briefly, but people haven't come in contact and I still can't hug, still can't shake their hands, but we're here together. We thank you, Lord, for bringing us here together. 
And we thank you that and when we find ourselves in pandemics and all situations, that we have joy in you today. Lord, many people are watching the church today and in the weeks ahead to see how we react, watching God's people to see how we react during this time. Lord, help us be an aroma for you, the aroma of Christ to the nations. Lord, I pray that my words today are your words, your spirit speaks through me. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Today, I wanna to give you three ways, three ways we can find joy as we love God with our whole heart. Three ways we can find joy as we love God with our whole heart. Number one, there's joy when Christ shows the way. There's joy when Christ shows the way as opposed to ourselves making our own way, amen? We've all been there and done that before. Verse 12 says that when he came to Troas to preach the gospel, that the Lord had opened a door for him there. Now it was Paul's custom to set sail from Troas on his missionary journeys. And while he was in Troas waiting for uh, Titus, his brother in the Lord, he was waiting for them. He, he was there and God opened a door to preach the gospel to the people of Troas. So here he is waiting for his assignment and God opens this opportunity to him to preach the gospel. And you know the Apostle Paul is not going to uh, not preach the gospel when a way has been opened. Now, we don't know exactly the way or what the door was, but he had an audience. And you know that the, the Apostle Paul brought the gospel message. Amen. Well, Paul had sent Titus to Corinth to hear how they had received his severe letter that he had written them. So he was anxious and he was nervous about how they had received a very stinging rebuke from him. And so while waiting for Titus to come back from Corinth, God opened this door for Paul to preach the gospel, so he did. And just as Paul was preaching the gospel in Troas as he was waiting, sometimes when we wait on God's plan, he might open temporary doors for us. Whatever that plan might be in our lives, God will open those temporary doors. And don't overlook the fact that, that God opens up doors and shows us the way when sometimes we're just simply waiting for the next plan to develop. In many ways, many of y'all have been waiting for eight weeks, haven't you? And I bet as we were singing songs, that's the most y'all stood in eight weeks, I bet. I was thinking, you got to get your church legs back, don't you? I'm serious, right? You might have walked with stand up for that long and kind of get, get your church legs, get in the routine. You've been, you've been waiting for eight weeks, and, and we still have some more time before we get back to normal. But we're spread out in here pretty well. Everybody looks great. You know what? We might, we might ask you to continue to spread out from here till eternity. I kind of like it. Yeah, It's kind of nice. No dead areas like we might have from time to time. You know. I don't know what I'm talking about anyway, but you know what I mean. So. But as we're waiting, as we're waiting, God can give opportunities to us. Now, I was just checking the Facebook feed, you know, we, we, uh, on the uh, live, and we would get 40, 50 different devices watching at a time, and I just thought we had like close to 20. People are still watching us on Facebook. So, hey, Facebook people, good to see you here again. Watching us on YouTube, watching us on television. You're here today. We're glad you're here today. But as we're waiting, God will open up doors for us as we seek to follow him. Paul says in verse 13 that his spirit was not at rest because he did not find his brother Titus there. So he took leave of them and went to Macedonia. So as Paul waited for news from Titus, he found himself unable to concentrate on the great opportunity that God had given him. He had given this great opportunity. The people in Corinth had been unrepentant. They had caused problems in Paul's life. One had physically assaulted him, but his heart still broke for that church. And he had these two opportunities that God had given him. This open door to preach the gospel to these new people who were eager to hear it. And then this established ministry that he had where people, some people were not wanting to hear it anymore. It's hard to imagine the evangelist Paul leaving a great opportunity to minister to a church he'd already been to that had problems, but that was the Spirit's calling in his life. Sometimes God may open a temporary door for us or another door as we're waiting, 
but the primary calling is still there. And for him, it was to go back to Corinth. God shows us the way. Sometimes he might even give us multiple good opportunities. And even though Troas seemed like a better situation than Corinth, Paul's spirit, the Holy Spirit in him, would not rest until he went there again and he dealt with that situation. Christ shows us the way. We must be obedient to his leading. There's many things you're going through right now that might be difficult. Maybe you're thinking there's a way out or something else to go to. Maybe God's giving you an open door, but you can't get this situation off your mind, out of your heart. Well, that's because God's still working in you to deal with that situation. There's joy when Christ shows us the way. And even if the way seems hard, you'd much rather be going down the hard road with Christ leading than the easy road with Christ not leading. Amen. Secondly, there's joy when Christ wins the battle. There's joy when Christ wins the battle. 14 says, But thanks be to God, Paul says, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. Now the imagery invoked here by Paul is that of a conquering war general who's been away fighting and winning battles. And upon his return, the crowd throws a parade for him and his army for his victories. I think of that that uh, the, the day, I think it's, uh, was it VJ Day or V, I can't remember what it's called, where you have the parades and, and for World War II and I think something like that, you know, and, or when there's a championship now when there's a parade down the city and, and sports, that kind of thing. But the meaning is clear here that Jesus Christ is our victorious general. He has fought our battles. He has defeated our enemy and through his work on the cross and his resurrection from the grave, Jesus Christ has defeated the curse of sin. He has defeated the curse of death. He won the battle we could not win. He secured the victory we could not secure. And every day we live, it is like Jesus is leading us in a triumphal procession to show the world that he alone is the victor. His procession leads us eventually into the kingdom of God where he'll be our eternal victor, our eternal leader. And as we fight our spiritual battles with Christ as our warrior king, we find ourselves marching alongside in that parade behind Jesus as he leads. We're like the, uh, the water boy on the championship football team, right? <laughs> we still get a ring. We still get to be a, be a part of it. Jesus is the leader. He is the victor. The Christian life is filled with battles, but those battles are all ultimately won in the power of Jesus Christ. And we march in a victory parade every day because of what Jesus has done for us. As Mr. Bill mentioned earlier, it doesn't matter what we go through in life, a recession, a war, a pandemic, murder hornets, right? Anything. The world throws at us. I saw there was a tropical depression turning off the East Coast. Did you hear about this? Doesn't matter what we go through, Jesus Christ is ultimately the victor. And he ultimately will come out on top. And we know that. So we can know that everything that's negative in our life will come to an end at some point. But he says, as we're going through this procession, that through us, verse 14, spreads the fragrance of of the knowledge of him everywhere, the fragrance of the knowledge of Jesus. As the victorious general would lead the procession down the city streets, there would be this unmistakable smell of incense. Have you ever smelled incense before? You know what I'm talking about, right? And the first time I ever smelled that, I thought, what is that? You know? Incense is the smell. And they would smell, it was the smell of victory for the general. And as we obediently preach and teach the gospel, as we walk through uh, the, down the road of life through Christ as our Lord and Savior, people should smell that victory through us. We should give off that aroma. We should be spreading this victorious fragrance everywhere that we go. But you know, the smell of victory to some is also the smell of loss to others. Did you know that? Somebody had to lose. The smell of victory to some is the smell of loss to others. Look at verse 15. We are the aroma of Christ 
to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. People will smell the aroma of Christ on us whether they're being saved or not. Verse 16, to one a fragrance from death to death, to the other a fragrance from life to life. When some smell the fragrance of Christ in Christians, it reminds them of death. Your mere presence in others' lives will do this. It will convict them of their sin. It reminds them of their guilt, which then reminds them that they are set to be judged one day. The human heart knows there's a judgment day coming. They can say there's not, they can rationalize it, but they, they know that they're guilty. And this is why lost people are often made uncomfortable by the smell, quote unquote, of Christians. This is why those will sometimes stay away from worship. Sometimes they feel like the eyes of you and I are watching them as they come in. Many will say that the church people are judging them as they come in. And sure enough, there probably are some church people judging them. But many times that judgment feeling is their own conscience reminding them that they are living a life of unrepentant sin and that God awaits them at their judgment. This is why the world as a whole is constantly trying to squash any type of Christian influence. When those who are hostile to the things of God and sin, when they smell the sweet aroma of Christ, it frightens them because it reminds them of their sin that is still left to be judged. We need to understand that reality. And if we were lost, if we had not been saved, if we had not placed our faith in Jesus Christ, we would be the same way. But to some lost people, the smell of Christ brings them life. For the heart where the Lord is working, for the heart that is turning toward the Lord, that smell is intoxicating. That smell is pleasing. and They want to know where you bought that perfume. <laughs> they want to know where you got that sweet-smelling deodorant. Think about some common smells and how people have a divided opinion about them. Think about the smell of gasoline. You know, some of you love gasoline. Raise your hand if you like the smell of gasoline. Nobody. Okay, maybe. Raise your hand if you don't like the smell of gasoline. Okay, some of you didn't vote. Okay, I know what that means. All right. Some love it, some don't like it. What about fresh cut grass? Raise your hand if you like the smell of fresh cut grass. Raise your hand if you do not like the smell of fresh cut. Yeah, see, see, we have the, even in the church, believe it or not, we have a disagreement in the church. Can you imagine that? Some people, fresh cut grass makes them, they like the smell. Some of it, it makes them think of allergies, right? It's stifling to them. What about nail polish? Some people love that smell. Some people hate that smell. Play-Doh, right? Some kids like to eat it. The smell of a campfire. Some people love it. Some people make feel like they're about to cough their heads off. What about the smell of hand sanitizer? We got real good with that lately. It's essentially alcohol, I guess, is what it is. Crayons. My little boy, John David, one and a half, loves to eat crayons. He'll put it in his mouth, and I'll say, get that out of your mouth. He'll say, yucky, yucky. It is yucky, so why are you eating it? I don't know. Sharpie markers. I'll catch kids sniffing markers. Some people hate the smell. Some people love that smell. Glue is the same way. And just as some of these smells make some sick to their stomachs, some of these smells are addictive to other people. And it's the same way with the aroma of Christ. Same way with the aroma of Christ. Paul becomes overwhelmed by the imagery of his own words. And he asks this question in 16, who is sufficient to be the aroma of Christ. We have the smell of Jesus on us, and we did nothing to earn it. We did nothing to receive it. We didn't buy it in the grocery store. We didn't order it from Amazon. We smell that way because of Jesus Christ, not for anything we've done. And the answer is no one. Finally, number three, and there's joy when Christ gives the word. Christ gives the word. Paul says in verse 17, for we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak 
in Christ. Part of the problem that Paul had in Corinth was these false apostles, these false prophets, false teachers. And Paul says there's many of them. And they actually turned the thing around on him and said that he was the one that was not, that he was the false teacher. And, and he says, no, we can tell the difference because some are peddlers of God's word. Now, when Paul speaks of peddlers, he has in mind those who would dilute wine and then sell it, right? And so obviously if you dilute the content of wine, you can then spread it out more and, and sell more and the buyer doesn't know what it's supposed to taste like. You know, we have, I've been putting these little packets in my water bottles that like flavor your water, you know? And Emily makes uh, a whole picture of hers and I ran out of mine and she's like, oh, I have a picture, you can use mine. And so uh, I, I poured some into my water bottle and guess what, it wasn't as strong. It was diluted, and I was like, Ugh, what is this, right, you know? And that's what she, but mine's a little stronger because it's, I guess, more concentrated and that kind of thing. This is what we're getting at. This real wine would have been, uh, would have been tasted better, but they're diluting it and selling it to the masses. And because more people have bought it, the peddler then makes more money because there's more to go around. In the same way, Paul is drawing this stark contrast to his own ministry and the ministry of those in Corinth who were peddling the gospel. They were diluting the content in order to sell to the masses. As a diluted gospel actually goes down easier. It's actually more appetizing. It's less judgy. <laughs> it's easier to eat, easier to drink. People will accept that diluted gospel more than the unadulterated word of God. They just will. Now, it's not good for them, but they'll eat it. They'll take it. They'll drink it. And the same thing happens today. There are many peddlers of the gospel who aren't preaching and teaching the whole gospel. And they dilute the message of the cross in the hopes that more will accept it. Paul says that they are not sincere as he is. And then he says that the only those who give the full, unadulterated, undiluted gospel of Christ are in fact commissioned by God. He says, men of sincerity as commissioned by God. And in the sight of God, he says, these sincere preachers speak in the power of Christ, not in their own power. And that's how you know the difference. Those speaking in the power of Christ, not in their own words, delivering the whole gospel. You know, I know that each week I stand up here and preach, and haven't been in a while, but I haven't again, right? I do so, as the Scripture says, in the sight of God. And that worries me more than what you think of what I say, is what God thinks of what I say. But I'm not only speaking in the sight of God, I'm speaking in the power of Christ, and that brings me comfort. If I was having to do this in my own power, I'd never have come up here. In the sight of God and in the power of Christ. It's a freeing thing to know that when you preach the gospel and are commissioned by God, you are speaking in the power of Christ. It's freeing for me. It's freeing for you. Because preaching in the power of Christ enables you to speak in the sight of God. It's not the messenger's job to tell you what I think you want to hear. It's the messenger's job. It's the Bible's job to tell you what God says, whether you want to hear it or not. Amen. And you know that. Now, how you will react to the smell of God's word is up to you. It's up to your heart. It's up to us. So as we close our time today, maybe you've realized that right now, for whatever reason, you just don't have much joy in your life. Maybe it's just this quarantine time. Maybe you haven't seen your grandkids as much, haven't been able to hug them. Maybe you haven't seen your children as much or your neighbors as much. Maybe that's good or bad, I don't know. <laughs> but let me ask you these questions if you are low on joy this morning. And it happens from time to time. Are you allowing Jesus to show you the way? Are you allowing Jesus to show you the way what your day should be like. It takes patience. I think we've all grown in a little bit of patience this last two months. Are you aware, number two, that Jesus is the one who fights the battle, not yourself? 
It takes surrender. We have to get in line and follow our leader. Let him fight the battle. But you know, it's so easy for us to fight it. It's so easy for us to say that thing, to do that thing, to be patient, to let Jesus fight the battle. And three, are you aware that joy comes from the word and nowhere else? It comes from the word and nowhere else. I caught myself a few times these few weeks just sitting around and going through Groundhog Day every day, right? Same day, same day. And it would dawn on me, because you know, my, my, my morning's a little, a little chaotic. Baby's up at seven in the morning, other three kids forget how to help, you know, that kind of thing. So you might always get off to a good start, reading the Bible, praying. And I'd be like, you know, I haven't been in the Word very much today. I go to the Word, I read, and I'm like, oh yeah, that's, that's where the joy's found. The joy's not found in a clean house. The joy's not found being able to go out to a restaurant. The joy's not found on the television. The joy's not found in the baby sleeping, right? The joy is found in the Word. Spend time reading and praying over the Word. Many of you, I've heard people tell me already, They've grown spiritually during this time, and I think that's great. That's what should happen. Spend time in your word. We're going to have our invitation here in a few minutes. Normally, I would be up front, down front to hug you and pray with you and hold your hand. I'm not going to do that today, although I'd love to. But I'm still going to be down front with the altars open for you. If you have a prayer need or something you want to talk to me about, you can feel free to talk to me afterwards and, or call me on the phone or you know, come by the office and we can talk and pray about it. But the altar is open today. Maybe you need to come down and pray at the altar. Just commit your life today to finding joy in Christ alone. Now, God gives us things that bring us happiness and bring us temporary joy. But our everlasting joy is found in Jesus alone. Maybe today you're overjoyed. Anybody here overjoyed? I mean, some of you are. You're just excited to be back here. Maybe you're overjoyed. You can come down too, and, and maybe you can just thank God for the joy in your life today. Thank God we're able to meet in the sanctuary. We're socially distanced, right? Safely. We have our masks on. And we're still able to worship. Amen? Maybe you just need to come down today and, and thank the Lord for being able to worship today. Maybe. There is one in here today that's never placed their faith in Christ before. You never asked him to forgive you your sins and give you eternal life. Today, you need to do that. God has called us, our church, First Baptist Church, to spread a certain kind of aroma to our community. And not everybody's going to like it. But it's the smell of victory to some. We know that. The aroma of joy is what we are to spread across our community. And how wonderful would it be if we all had this certain smell about us as we walked in and someone says, something's different with that person. What is it? And we know the answer, Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, as we close our time together today, Lord, I pray that as we enter into our time of invitation, that you search our hearts today, that those that need to ask you to be their joy will do so, and that those that need to pour out praises of thankfulness to you for being their joy will do so, that those that need to place their faith in you today, maybe they're watching online today, they need to do that today and make that commitment today. Father, we love you. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for his death and burial and his resurrection, how he gives us eternal life today. And Lord, we are so thankful we're gathered today. We pray for our brothers and sisters who can't be here, who would love to be here. We're thankful for them too. We're thankful for that they are there in their houses watching with us in spirit, commenting amen. We're thankful for that, Lord. We hope to see them soon as well. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.